One thing you may not know about me is I have an older brother who has cerebral palsy. Now, um, that's, a, uh, that's a thing that affects a lot of different people in, in different ways. It's basically a, um, a part of the brain that didn't develop um, all the way. And, um, and so it kind of affects different parts of the body. And um, some people, it's very severe and they're very low functioning. And some people, it's very minor and, and they're very high functioning. Uh, my brother, I would say, is kind of right there in the middle. Uh, mentally, he can carry on a conversation with you. He's very smart, and, um, but he, he's not able to walk. He's been in a wheelchair um, his entire life. Now, in our house, that was just normal. It was just normal. I mean, we fought just like normal brothers would. I didn't, I didn't take it easy on him, and, and he surely didn't take it easy on me. Uh, he was mean, um, and I was mean right back. Uh, but it was just kind of a normal part of, of, of life. I love my brother, Sam. It's funny because growing up, there'd be um, other kids, other friends that would come over to our house, and they'd say, Andy, why is your brother like that? I'd say, why is he mean? Like, I don't know. Like, I guess brothers are mean. And they'd say, no, you know what I mean. Like, like why, is, why is he in a wheelchair? I said, well, he, you know, he has cerebral palsy. Why does he have cerebral palsy? I'm like, I don't know. Like, why do you have blonde hair? Like, I, I don't know. It just, he just does. I never questioned it. It wasn't a, something that I was trying to figure out. Like, why, why is he like this? It was just a normal part of our family life. It was normal to help your brother get up and get ready for the day. It was normal to, to help him with food and, and drinks. It was, it was normal to park in the handicapped spot right up at the front. And, and, and it was normal to always go places in a van and not have have any chairs in the middle because that's where his, uh, his wheelchair would fit. That was just a normal part of our life. We didn't question why. But it wasn't for me until the end of my junior year, the summer between junior year and, and my senior year, that I began to question. Because uh, Sam got sick on that particular summer and um, he was put in the local hospital. And then from that hospital, he was transported to the hospital in Houston. And, and things got really bad. Things got so bad that the doctors at one point called my parents in and they said, you know, we're really not sure what's going on. Uh, and his, his breathing was, was getting worse. His condition was, was getting worse. And they weren't sure, you know, if, if he was even going to make it. And I remember at that point, I began to ask the question, why? All the things that I had been taught about God, God is loving, God is kind, God is in control, and, and God has a plan. Like, I had never questioned those things until that particular summer. And I began to get honest with God and say, God, why? Why him? Why Sam? I mean, he, he has cerebral palsy. He's been in the wheelchair his, his entire life. Why is he the one who's laying in a hospital bed in downtown Houston about to die? Why? Why not me? Why not my other brother? <laughs> He's mean too. <laughs> Why not my younger sister? Why not my parents? Why not another family, right? Why not somebody else? Why is this happening to him? I remember wrestling with those, with those questions. And I would imagine, I would dare say that, that you, maybe at some point in your life, you've wrestled with a similar question of why. Why is this happening to me? Why am I the one going through this particular situation? What did I do to deserve this? Maybe you've asked that question. Maybe there's someone that you love who is asking that question to you. Um, and it all kind of culminates with this one big question, why do bad things happen to good people? I think we've all asked that question or we've all heard somebody ask that question. Now listen, Books have been written, sermons have been preached, tweets have been tweeted. There's been a lot of information about, about this question, right? We, we have these small minds, you know, finite minds, and we're trying to understand and comprehend this really big, massive question of why. Why is this going on? You know what's interesting? Um, we're not the first generation to ask that question. 
I would dare say, I, I would bet money on it if I were you know, betting money on things. I would bet money that your parents have asked that question before in their life. And I bet your grandparents at one point in their life asked that question. I bet your great, great grandparents at some point asked some form of that question. And here's the thing. In John chapter 9, we're going to read where even the disciples asked Jesus a very similar question. They wanted to know the rationale for why man was born blind. They wanted to know the reasoning. Let's read it. In John chapter nine, started in verse one. It says this, and he passed by and he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, this is, they're asking Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? In other words, they're saying, Jesus, why is he like that? Why is he blind? Why, why is this happening to him? What's interesting is the way they frame the question, they give Jesus two possible scenarios as if they, they, they really believe they're onto something. They really believe that they, out of all the possibilities, there's an infinite amount of possibilities of why this man was born blind, the disciples have narrowed it down to two things. It was either his sin or it was his parents' sin. Which one is it, Jesus? Now think about it for a second. And I know we're not in their culture. I know, you know, reading the Bible like today and uh, we, we kind of, you know, project like these guys were, were morons, you know, they didn't, they didn't know a whole lot. You know, how could they ask a question like that? But it, I, I guarantee you, if we were in their shoes, we would be asking the exact same question. But let's just kind of think about the rationale of that for a second. Do we really believe that the man was born blind because of his own sin? If he was blind from birth, and that means there's a couple different things that, that might have happened, that maybe he sinned in the womb. Play that out with me for a second. What, what's he doing in the womb? Poking at his mom? <laughs> maybe she's having a bad day and she's like, stop that. You know what happens when your kids, you can tell them to stop that, right? Nothing, right? They just keep doing it, right? So maybe he poked his mom again and she's like, don't let me tell you again. And he's just in the little womb grinning, you know, he's smaller, he's half the size of Isaiah and he's small and he's like, huh, one more time, pook. And he disobeys his mom and so God strikes him with blindness. Is that, is that really what we think happens here? Now, part of the thinking in that culture was, you know, there's kind of this, this cycle of events, like maybe, you know, there was some former life that he had committed sin. So in this life, he's being punished um, because of, because of that, that former life. And so God has um, allowed him to be born with blindness. Some people say, well, maybe it was his future sins. Maybe God was actually pre-punishing him um, for future sins. My parents used to say that. Andy, it's time for your weekly spanking. I'm like, I didn't do anything. We're just going to spank you for something you might do in, in the future. Just kind of, it doesn't make any sense, does it? That he would be born blind because of his own sin. The other possibility that they pulled out of the hat was, well, it must be his parents' sin. I mean, maybe they did something before he was born. Maybe they did something before they were married that they weren't supposed to do. And God is punishing them by giving them a child with, with a disability. That doesn't even compute, does it? That doesn't even make sense. It's not, it's not punishment to have a child with, with, with a disability. It's not because of the parent's sin. So, but this is what they had come up with. And then Jesus throws them an incredible curveball, doesn't he? They were expecting A or B, and Jesus says in verse 3, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. Now, their minds are already blown. Do what? Like, Jesus, are you sure? Like, we've thought about all the possibilities, and it has to be one of these two. And Jesus said, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. Notice what he says. But it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Did you catch that? He, he's not born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. He's, he's born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in his life. Here's the bottom line today. He's blind, not because of what was done, but because of what will be done. 
Think about that for a second, all right? Let's, let's kind of mull on that for a minute. The man was born blind, not because of something in the past, but because of something that was coming in the future. Not because of previous sin, but because of something in the future where God was going to do an incredible, redeeming work in his life. Listen, there is an incredible shift that happens in our minds, in our, in our perspective, in our faith, when we move out of what was into what will be. When we move out of kind of living in the, in the past, when we start to have a perspective of what's coming in our future, hey, isn't that what salvation really is all about? Isn't that, what, isn't that what God redeeming us spiritually, saving us from our sins? Isn't that that message that God takes our past and he doesn't give us a, a place in heaven you know, because of what we've done in the past, but he gives us a place in heaven because what's done in the past has been canceled out by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so what will be in the future is this incredible, glorious time that we get to spend with God forever and ever and ever. And so Jesus says, hey guys, you, you, you got it all wrong. This man is not, is not suffering because of something in the, in the past. This man is suffering because of something that was coming in the future. Here's the thing. We want to look back for the reason, but God looks ahead for the purpose. If you're taking notes, I'll give you time to write that one down, all right? We want to look back for the reason, but God looks ahead for the purpose. And I believe that there's a difference between reason and purpose. Reason kind of describes cause and effect. Like if I kick you in the shin, that sounds mean. If you kick me in the shin, I'll make you the bad guy. If you kick me in the shin, there's a reason that my shin is going to be hurting, right? Because there was a cause. It looks back. Why is my shin hurting? Well, there has to be a cause. There has to be a reason. You kicked me in in the shin. There might not be any purpose for that. So reason looks back, purpose looks ahead, doesn't it? So this morning I was driving to church, and I, I think I have a 12 and a half minute drive from my house here to, to Carver. And here's my prayer this morning. I usually kind of pray some, some prayer for the day. I'm going to be on My prayer today was, God, I'm not sure how to illustrate reason and purpose. Like, it makes sense in my head, but I'm not sure if I can really communicate that um, effectively today. So, God, can you give me just a really good illustration? And guess what I thought of? Nothing. <laughs> I didn't think of anything. Until we were setting up. We get here about 8.30, and we have an incredible team that, that sets this whole place up. It takes about an hour and a half. If you want to join us, you're more than happy to, but you have to wait till next fall because, thank the Lord, we don't have to set up and tear down this summer. Woohoo! <laughs> So we're putting up these black drapes over here, and these are lo lovely black drapes. And someone says, Andy, why, what, what's the reason that these are so high? And I'm, I'm looking at them, and I'm like, I don't know. Those are pretty tall drapes. They really, they could be 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, but right now they're sitting at 11 feet, and I don't have any idea as to why they're that tall. There's no reason. There's no cause for the reason of those being um, that that high. So then I went and asked the person who's kind of in charge of our pops and drape. And I said, is there a, is there a reason? She said, no, and this, this is God just like giving me like a living illustration. Like, thank you, Lord. This, and, and she says, no, there's no reason that those are that high. She said, but the purpose of it is, is because these drapes are that high. That's the reason these are, that's the purpose of this one, because these are that high. I'm like, well, why are those that high? She said, because the cafeteria is over there. And that actually covers everything. And if we took these at this high, then it just everybody would be like, well, these are different heights than, than this one. I hope I'm, I'm making my case. There's not a reason they're 11 foot, but there is a purpose. It's kind of like when we ask our kids, make your bed. And they're like, it's 8 o'clock at night. Why, why should we make our bed? What's the reason? I don't have a reason for you to make your bed, but I have a purpose. I'm teaching you obedience. I'm teaching you habits. I'm teaching you how to have a clean room, right? There's a lot of purpose that comes in the future, but there may not necessarily be a reason in the past. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to get the disciples. That's what he's trying to get us to really latch onto. There's not a reason that the man was born blind, but there's an incredible purpose. And that gives hope in the times of suffering. 
It gives hope in the times of suffering. Listen, what I want to do today is not just give you this little thought or a cliche about reason and purpose. I want to give you some action steps to do, okay? Love action steps. I love kind of taking what the Bible says and let's make it practical to our everyday life. And today I want to give you two action steps. The first one is if there's somebody around you, if there's somebody, you know, in your life who is going through a time of suffering or hardship or, or trial, there's something I'm going to ask you to do. And the second one we're going to talk about is if you're in that spot, like if you're in that place of, of suffering or, or hardship or trial, there's something I'm going to ask you to do today. All right, so let's start with the first one. If there's somebody in your life who's struggling, somebody in your life who's going through a hard time, here's what we all need to do. We need to talk less and love more. Talk less and love more. We didn't say act more, we said love more. I believe that love is an action, it's something that we do, but it's deeper than just going and doing it. There's a, there's a motivation behind it that comes from the heart. So we talk less and we love more. As I read John 9 this past week, there's something that just really kind of stuck out to me. And here's what it was. Everybody was talking about the blind man. Everybody was talking about the blind man. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Not like your teenage son says everybody. Everybody's going to the movies, mom. And he means like two people. But in this, like everybody in John 9, outside of Jesus Christ, everybody is talking about the blind man. We're not going to read the entire chapter, but let me draw your attention to a few verses. In verse 8, or, or here's kind of what happens. Jesus spits on the ground. He makes mud, puts the mud in his eyes tells the blind man to go to the pool of Siloam, which means to be sent, and wash. And it says that the man, he didn't just gain sight. It says that he received sight. It was a gift. He, he gave, God gave this blind man the gift of, of sight, and he received sight. His eyes were open. And what did everybody do? Everybody started talking about the blind man. Verse 8, it says the neighbors were talking about him. In verse 9, it says that others were talking about him. Later on in verse 9, still others were talking about him. So what they do? They brought him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they started talking about him. They started asking him questions, trying to figure out how this happened, why this happened, who did this. They brought in the parents, and the parents talk about their once blind son. That doesn't suffice. They bring the man back in. The Pharisees talk about him again. Everybody is talking about the blind man, even the disciples. Look back at verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. And what did the disciples do? They said, hey, Jesus, here's a blind man. Let's heal him. Let's help him. Let's bless him. They didn't say that, did they? They said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? They used his condition as a talking point to ask Jesus a theological question. They're not concerned about how they can help the man, how they can love the man, how they can talk to the man. But instead, they're just talking about the man, about the problem, about the situation. Hey, we can talk about people or we can talk to people. And what does Jesus do? He talks to the man. And notice what he says in verse four. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Hey, we gotta be, we gotta be busy doing the works of our father, not just for busyness sake, but for the purpose's sake, for the kingdom's sake. We gotta be loving more. Hey, we, we, can, we can sit back and we could talk about helping other people and we can question whether or not people are deserving of our help or we can help. <laughs> we can do we can engage the community, the hurting, the, the lost, the blind, the poor, the sick, who God has placed around us. And I believe we talked about this in one of our earlier messages, but when God opens up your eyes to see a need, we often wanna take that need to somebody else. But when God opens up our eyes to see a need, that is an invitation to us to meet that need, to do something about it to love them enough to show them Jesus Christ. Hey, here's the thing. 
It's the Holy Spirit's job to convince people of who Jesus is. It's our job as a follower of Jesus Christ to show people who Jesus is. I can't convince anybody to follow Jesus, but I can show them the love of Jesus. And it is the Holy Spirit's work that convinces people in in their heart to become a a follower of, of Jesus. And so, we need to learn to talk less and, and love more. Hey, this summer, we're, we're approaching summer. I know the thermometer says we approach summer, you know, back in April, but um, we're kind of, you know, school's out, summer's here. We want to leverage this summer to show our community the love of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do. We don't want to get to the end of the summer and look back and say, wow, we took some really great vacations and we did some really cool stuff and thankfully we didn't have to set up or tear down. No, we, we want to immobilize um, we'll take the E off that. Let's just, let, we want to mobilize our church to show the love of Jesus Christ in our community. And there's four opportunities that, um, that we believe God has led us to for this summer. And uh, you have a little piece of paper there. I want to quickly work through those. The first one actually starts next week. Next week, we have a, a team coming in from um, uh, very south Arkansas. Uh, they're going to come and, and serve with us on behalf of us for a couple of days. And so next Monday and Tuesday, we are partnering with the Boys and Girls Club. We've chosen the Boys and Girls Club because they're doing incredible work of, of, uh, of being a place for, for hundreds of, of kids and students to come throughout the entire summer. And so um, we have these, these students and, and adults that are going to go next Monday and Tuesday. And uh, we're starting this relationship because this fall, it looks like we have the possibility of actually starting a mini club at the Boys and Girls Club so we can kind of have this ongoing relationship with them. And so uh, for two days, um, we're gonna be serving alongside other people, uh, just hanging out and loving on, on kids and, and students. It's the first two days of their summer camp. And so, um, and that's, a, that's an incredible opportunity coming very soon. Uh, so be in, be in prayer about that. On July the 4th, we're having our second annual uh, service at the July 4th celebration. Uh, we're doing a diaper changing station again at San Gabriel Park. Not a baby changing station. We're not exchanging babies, okay? Uh, but we will let people come and, and change a clean diaper. We're creating an environment where they can do that. Last year, we gave out about 1,000 cold bottles of water. On July 4th, we gave away about 1,000 Frisbees. And uh, we're going to be doing that again uh, this summer. It's a great way for us just to go to where our community already is and to show them the love of Jesus Christ. In mid-July, there's another community project. We're looking at partnering with another nonprofit that we're already kind of partnering with. And uh, so we've got more details about that hopefully coming soon. And then on August the 11th, we're teaming up with uh, more than 20 other churches in Georgetown for a day of service called Love Georgetown. And uh, what that may, really is not even a full day. It's really just half a day, like from 8 o'clock to, to noon, where we're going to be all over the community just serving in, in different areas. And so here's what I'm ask you to, asking you to do today. I'm just asking you to make a commitment to, to one of those. I'm just asking you to just to kind of step out of, you know, let's talk about doing things and, and living on mission. And, I mean, here's a great opportunity for you to pick one of these and, and actually love people, show people the love of, of Jesus Christ. Now, you can kind of come in at, at low commitment level. Maybe you'll say, I'll do one hour on 4th of July, preferably the coolest part of the day, uh, but I'll do one hour. If you love Jesus, you'll do the hottest part of the day, all right? Uh, maybe, maybe that's just kind of a, a bare minimum entry level. You're like, oh, I'll try this. Maybe you'd like to kind of go all in and, uh, and spend two entire days with, uh, with students that, that live kind of on, on in this area of town through, um, through the Boys and Girls Club. And there's different kind of things in between that. I'm just asking you to pray and look for an opportunity for God uh, to show you to get plugged in to loving people right here in Georgetown, Texas. Listen, there's people around us who are hurting, who are discouraged, and who are going through difficult times. And you never know if it's a cold uh, bottle of water, if it's for an hour of playing, you know, um, checkers, you know, with a child or, or shooting hoops, you just never know um, what conversations will come out of those serving opportunities. Let me just challenge you to do that, all right? So here's kind of the second thing, then we'll wrap up. If you're going through a time of, of hardship and suffering, if you find yourself in that place and you're asking, you know, why me? 
Like, what, what did I do to deserve this? Why, why am I going through this? I want to give you just kind of one thing to kind of put into practice even, even today and kind of ongoing as well, all right? And here's what it is. Um, ask what now, not why me. Ask what now, not why me. See, why me is actually a, a complaining question. It's a, it's a complaint. It's a, it's a complaint. God, why? Phew, I don't deserve this. It's a complaining question. What now? It's an empowering question. It empowers you to begin to take steps forward in your, in your walk with Christ. It, when you ask what now, you set your mind away from looking back in the past, trying to look for the reason, and you start looking towards the future saying, what's the purpose? Okay, what now? You know, if your spouse leaves you, you could ask, why me? Or you could say, what now? That's, that's a hard spot. But don't ask why me. Say, okay, what now? You lose your job, you, you can say, well, why me? Or you could say, what now? The doctor says, the results are in and it's cancer. You could say, why me? Or you could say, all right, what now? It's a question that moves us towards the future and looking for the purpose. Notice what, what Jesus does to the man. He doesn't just heal him right there on the spot. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And what does he do? He does it. That was his what's now. That's how the man discovered the purpose. And what was the purpose? It wasn't just physical healing of, of eyesight, physical eyesight. There was a spiritual healing of spiritual eyesight. Because notice what God does in this man's life. He takes a beggar off the streets and he places him in the, in the synagogue, in the, in the temple where all the religious people were. And he makes him a living testimony of who Jesus is. The Pharisees, they were, they were good at commentary. But when the blind man showed up, they got to see a documentary. They got to see a life Change. In fact, in their questioning of him, the, the man, I, I could just picture him like rolling his eyes. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. That's an incredible story. You can't argue with that, can you? That's an incredible story. God takes this man off the streets and he places him in the temple to be a living testimony of who Jesus is. He gives him physical sight, but he also gives him spiritual sight. And what's interesting is all those Pharisees, they were spiritually blind. They could not see who Jesus was. They were blinded, blinded by their own pride. I think they were blinded by their own self-righteousness. Towards the end of John 9, in verse 35, this is after the Pharisees literally kicked the man out of the temple. They, they basically banned him. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out and finding him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and he is the one talking with you now. You've seen him. You've seen him physically, but you've also seen him spiritually. See, the story is, is beyond just the physical eyesight. There was spiritual eyesight that was given. There was spiritual recognition of who the Savior of the world is. Can I ask you a question? Do you have spiritual eyesight today? Do, do you see who Jesus really is? Or are you blinded, maybe like the Pharisees, blinded by your own pride? Listen, we can't come to Jesus without humility. It takes humility. We have to humble ourselves before the Lord. And pride blinds us from seeing Christ. Self-righteousness blinds us from seeing Christ. Self-righteousness is basically saying, I'm good enough without him. There ain't nobody on this planet who's good enough. Mother Teresa wasn't good enough. We desperately need to see Jesus for who he is was and who he is. He is the son of God. He is the savior of the world. He is the Messiah. He was the culmination of prophecies that were made about him. And one of those prophecies in Isaiah was this, when the Messiah comes, he will give sight to the blind. And then here we see that story being played out both physically, but also spiritually. Let me end with this question. What is keeping you from seeing Jesus? What's keeping you from seeing Jesus? I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and, 
and, and close your eyes. Listen, I don't know what, what God is asking you to do today. Maybe for you today, um, you just needed to know that in the situation that you're in, there may not be a reason for it, but you just need to know there is a purpose. There is a purpose that's coming. Maybe you're here today and you needed to hear, talk less, love more. Maybe you're here today and you needed to hear, stop asking why me and start asking what now. But maybe you're here today and you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior for the first time. See, when that man, that blind man, when he left Jesus and he went to the pool of Siloam to wash, that was an act of faith. That's all it was. He was just believing what Jesus said. That's what faith is. It's believing what Jesus said. And the Bible says this about, about Christ, that God took him who had no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. We don't get perfection by being good. We don't get perfection by coming to church. We get perfection through Jesus. Have you trusted him? Have you said yes to him? Have you invited him to be the Lord, the, the boss, the master, the savior of your life? If you haven't done that, I want to encourage you maybe to pray a, a prayer like this. God, I, I come to you today. Not even really sure how, but I just, God, I just come asking that you would save me through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I recognize my own blindness. I recognize my own need for you today. Father, I pray that you would open up my eyes so that I can see what you would have me to see. God, and I trust you completely. I trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross to save me today on June 3rd, 2018. God, and I commit my life to you. And I commit myself to be a follower of Jesus Christ so that I can be a witness, a living documentary, a testimony to others of who Jesus is. In Jesus' name.